Well, welcome back to the podcast. 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 <laughs> Very podcast. Good. The podcast. Podcast. Uh, that's right. We're Jenny and Levi Lesko. That's Lesko. what happens when I start. We're your hosts. I don't know what to say. We're glad you're here. Uh, these are the things we could work out on our own time, but here we are. Here we are talking to you about all the things, and we're glad you're here. Today yeah. is going to be a great conversation, especially if you feel overwhelmed by your phone, your social media, just all this stuff. It's just the, what's pulling at you. Mm. And if you feel like, man, I just need a break. If you've considered a little purge of your social media, this conversation is going to be very instructive. It's so good. Because we have today on Doctor, the good doctor, doctor. Darren Whitehead, who is the author of the new book, The Digital Fast, mm -hmm. 40 Days to Detox Your Mind and Reclaim What Matters Most. Brilliant. And in the conversation, Darren is going to invite you, anybody who wants to be a part of it, to a church-wide, he's trying to get as many Christians as he can around the world, to take a... A digital de detox, whether you're really will willing or ready for the 40 day or or 21 days at the beginning of the year, a miniature. Mm -hmm. Which and I personally am you want excited the mini about. one. I want the mini. You're not going to do the full, the full I want our whole church to do the mini. So, really, it's up to you whether you feel like your soul needs a big detox or a baby detox. You get to pick <laughs> that. So, Darren's going to talk about why that would matter, what that would do to you to reclaim your sanity. The story behind it is powerful. Yeah, the, it's good. The clutches of notifications mm -hmm. and being just pulled a thousand different directions. Yeah. I'll tell you, anytime I've, um, you know, taken steps to curtail screen time or taking a break. It's always been good for it's me. It's always a good idea, never a bad idea. That's right. And don't post about it. I, you know, I, I just has a pet peeve when people post about not being on social media. Like when they're announcing that they're going to be it's gone like for a while. It's like eating one last donut and saying, well, I'm going on a diet now. You know what I mean? It's like the post of like, I'm taking a break. I don't know why did this just huh. drive me crazy. Do they bother you? I don't know. Do you feel like I, you see them? I mean, I'm not really... Oh, just the very You're act. the one who tells me like, hey, did you see that this person was here? And I'm like, no. No shade if you've done it. Okay, Lusketeers. But like posting about how you're not going to be posting, just don't post. And everyone will know you didn't post. No posts. Speak with your silence. Mm. It, a, a not post that speaks yeah, louder than thousand, a thousand words. I hear you. Um, plus then, if you do break and you come back on and you accidentally like something or like- Then, then everyone's like, you oh, will be judged. You know? So maybe that's why they're doing it for the built-in accountability. Oh yeah, that's that makes sense. So, um, all right, never mind. Do it. Do what you want. That's just my th <laughs> my personal thoughts. Second answer. On, it's like one last time. I just need one last fix. I if I can get this drug in one last time, then I will take. I a mean, break. you're not far from. It's truth. a little bit that way. Yeah. You know, then you what? I don't know what you. What, are you asking for everyone to applaud you? Just do it. Just do it. So, um, yes, this conversation with Darren is amazing. Mm. We also had a few other oh, things. A right. few or one, I don't well, remember. Well, but. we're excited. We've made some really special announcements regarding Movement Conference. Yes. Some of you might know, Jenny and I, every summer uh, we host a youth conference uh, that, that youth and groups and families come from around the country to attend. Uh, it's called Movement Conference. The website is mvmnt25.com. Mm -hmm. And we recently announced that we have some pretty special guests coming. Yes. We well, first of all, the dates are July 24th through the 27th. That's right. And we announced Taya. I mean, just give me a break. Come on. You have heard her in Hillsong United, sings the song Oceans and Touch the Sky. Devil Know Not Today. Don't know, not today. Her voice is so good. So good. She's now got a, a solo project, uh, self-titled Taya, that's out. She's going to be coming. She's never been to Montana before. She's very excited oh about it. Oh, my gosh. And she's just a beautiful soul. I feel like whenever I just even hang out with her, she's just... Taya's wonderful. I'm, I become a better person. We also have Carrie Job and Cody Carnes coming. Yay, I'm They're so excited. a treat, a joy. Um, so many great songs. Such Some great of my spirits. Faves. Yes. We have Sadie Robertson Huff coming. Goodness gracious. She's a powerhouse, isn't she? She's such a sweetheart. I love her so she's much. She's like America's sweetheart. We watched her grow up on Duck Dynasty. Then she started dancing. dancing and is really good dancer. Now she's this prolific preacher and podcaster. Live Original, her podcast. We've been on a bunch of times. The um, conference she does every year is called Live Original. She's, yeah. she's just amazing. Yeah. And she's coming to preach in Montana at Movement Conference this summer. Yes. As well as our friend and author, Pastor Sean Johnson. Yes. Uh, he wrote uh, an insane book on anxiety, how to attack so anxiety. Good. He's going to be preaching. I, I just think it's going to be one of the best conferences ever. I believe it. And that's not even the full lineup. Nope. We got more. And to, more dot, 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 dot. And more dot, dot, dot. 
Um, so anyhow, get registered. It's also the cheapest it's ever going to be because there's a price increase coming in December. Yep. So if you have teenagers and you don't have to be a pastor to come, bring your, bring your teenagers, invite some of their friends or yeah. just make it a special trip with you and a ch one of your children. Yeah. Uh, get registered today because when the price increases, even if you add more to your group later, you'll be locked in at this price. So why not now? It, if if ever, today is the day. Today is the day. MVMNT25.com. Of course, the link is in the description in the show notes, so you can get it there. But um, today, you're going to... You're going to love this combo yeah. with our friend who's also a pastor, by the way. Yes. Dr. Darren leads Church of the City. Dr. Pastor. Dr. Pastor Whitehead leads Church of the City uh, in Tennessee. Yep. So, all right. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy. Well, Darren Whitehead, uh, thank you for coming on. Hey, it's Celeskos. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to have you, bro. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I love you guys, and it's I am delighted to be on here with you. We will have to do it again with uh, with your lovely wife, Brandy, because she's uh, fantastic. Yes. Yes, yes, that would be amazing. Yeah, she's everyone's favorite Whitehead. She, that's so good. <laughs> um, yeah. Your daughter is amazing too. I met her really briefly when we mm -hmm. were at your church. You guys hosted an event that we were at, and for, actually for Caleb, it was one of the like pop up worship night things. That's right. And That's she right. She was backstage, and she was so delightful to talk to. Which it was? I can't recall uh, either. Uh, I think it was Scarlett. I have three teenage daughters. I want to say she was just starting her senior year of high school. Is that sound okay. right? That's my oldest. That's Sydney. Yes. Okay, so maybe it would have been her there. It was yeah. with like Torin Wells and a couple other artists, and it was That's real right. briefly backstage. But she was so nice. Well, she has her moments, but uh, <laughs> amazing. She, she, yeah, I, I had a friend Spoken tell like me a once, true dad. I, you know, I had a friend tell me once, uh, and I took a lot of comfort in this. He said, uh, don't worry about your teenagers. He said, you know, if you want to know what they're really going to be like when they're adults, watch them when they're around their friends, parents, oh. and that's who they're going to be. Because like when my daughter's around my friends, parents or around my friends, they're like, hey, can I clean up? Can I do the dishes? Is there anything you need done around the home? I'm like, who is this child? <laughs> yeah. But he's like, he's like, you watch. That's who they become as adults. And I'm like, let's go. Wow. That's amazing. That's brilliant. Okay, so yeah. we're, we're like, Noted. We, I feel like, that, okay, I'm going to have to jot that down. That's a I'll good parental theory. Are you pretend writing? <laughs> Jenny's air writing. Here. That's, like, <laughs> that's so pandering and condescending, Jenny. At least yeah, really write it. That's how people... Uh, <laughs> takes notes from my sermons as well. <laughs> yeah, my church doesn't hey, even... let me get that down. <laughs> Our church doesn't even pretend anymore. They don't even give me the lip service. It's just as what it is. 17 years in, they just like, yeah, we get it. We've heard this before. I'm a, I'll always take notes. Um, yeah, Jenny takes notes, but that's literally it. But as long as, as, long as you're still happy, I'm happy, babe. We're okay, going to be good. fine. Um, <laughs> when we... Our, our daughter, we took to college uh, this last uh, fall. We dropped mm -hmm. her off at college, came home, and... She would FaceTime us the first couple of weeks and be like, I woke up early today. I, I, I'm, I'm late doing this. Da, da, da. I'm, and it was like all the things we would always be honored to do when she was in our house. Uh, she never did. She's yeah. doing now on her own. So I feel like it's a little bit of yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's almost like they're catching this parenting thing, you know, like mm. the values that we're trying to instill in them. They don't want to let us know when they're in our home. But uh, when we when we release them into the wild, it's almost like they listened. Dang, that's comforting. That's got like <laughs> let it the, be, Lord. For the Lusketeer, that's what we call our listeners who are who is in the throes of childhood or adolescence mm -hmm. and is so discouraged. I can just feel that encouraging the love out of into somebody's heart right now. <laughs> you know, I just I just said to my wife yesterday, if I could go visit myself from even six years ago. And tell myself something about parenting, you know what I would say? Hey, it's going to be okay. Mm. It's going to like, it's, it's, it's all going to work out. Yeah. And, and my, my kids are, you know, my kids are not in their twenties. You know, my oldest is, is 18, but they're all doing good. They haven't always been doing good <laughs> and they're all just doing good. Okay. So like, what are the ages then? So 18 and then what, how do you go down from uh, there? 18, almost about to turn 16 and about to turn 14. So 18, 16, 14. Wow. Yeah, so just literally back. three teenage girls in the three house. Three teenage girls. Yeah. Yeah. There is always someone crying in my house. It's usually me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. 
<laughs> okay, yeah. So I feel you, bro. We have four daughters. We had four girls in a row and then a little boy. So there are some times when I look at Lennox and I'm like, bro, we need to back away quietly and just, <laughs> they won't even notice. Just go. <laughs> just, just we'll God. go get dirty and just drive my Jeep around. We'll find a place. So shoot bows and arrows, whatever. Yeah. So, so I just turned 50 and on the yeah. day before my, on the day before my 50th birthday, I got for the first time in my life, a dog wow. and I have a male dog. So I got a house full of estrogen and me and my dog. Yeah. What kind of dog did wow. you get? Wow. Congratulations. It's, it's, I, I need to confess. It's not a manly dog. It is a Havanese. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to Google, Sissy let's Google that. Let me see a picture Habanese. of a Habanese dog. No, do, I do, we do know Sissy Goff. She's amazing. Sissy, Sissy has this dog. And uh, I was with Sissy one day and I was just like, that is <laughs> the sweetest natured dog I have ever seen. Oh, there's a lot of hair involved. A lot of to, hair. We'll have to put some images on the screen so people <laughs> who... Like, a lot can, of hair. Looks like some have little ponytails, but yours probably doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, I ended up getting... <laughs> the dog from the same breeder that Sissy got her dog from. And, and honestly, uh, Sissy's a therapist, if you don't know that. Oh, we um, love her. Yeah, Raising Boys and Girls podcast, a oh. prolific author. She's been on the podcast, our, our, our podcast multiple times. She's so good. She's amazing. She's amazing. She's amazing. But she has the dog because the presence of this dog uh, is, is, is really calming for children. She specializes in children. Mm. Really calming for children. And this sweet little dog, you know, sits there and, and then just – puts her face down on the sofa and just watches everyone. And, and I'm just like, sissy, where did you find this dog? <laughs> so uh, she gave me the breeder and I got literally the brother to her dog. Oh, That's my so gosh. That is so sweet. Now, so you have a buddy. Is your dog, is your dog um, uh, treated so it can't have children? It is. Treated. It is. That was so kind. Wait a second. Uh, what's the word? Neutered, neutered or spayed? Neutered. I couldn't remember. I, in my mind, I wasn't confident as to which one it was. <laughs> treated so, I just, so that they can't have children. Male and, and spayed is female. Okay. Thank you, Darren. I should <laughs> yeah. call you Dr. Darren because you do I, have I, a PhD. Listen, I'm in this space. I, I literally asked that question to the vet a week and a half ago. What's the difference, bro? And yeah. Don't worry. So, I'm taking notes. Well, okay. So I was exact same. Jenny's taking notes again. So she's writing it down. Spade, she's good. Right. Spade, Noted. Her, pen, her Noted. pen's not even out yet. And she's like seven inches off the paper. <laughs> oh, you're pandering. Um, so when we had had four girls uh, before our son was born, same thing. I was like, well, I'm getting a dog. Uh, and my wife and my oldest daughter were like, well, we're both allergic to dogs, so you can't oh. get a dog. <laughs> but we did research and found out that, you, that, that poodles don't have dander. So they're hypoallergenic. So the yes. only dog I could get to solve my problem of being the only male <laughs> in an all-female house was a is, poodle. Is he right? <laughs> but Jenny didn't yes. want a big poodle. She wanted a little poodle. So we ended up with a miniature poodle. And, yes. and then the breeder, as a condition of buying him, can, insisted on the dog being neutered. So I was like, wait a minute. So my solution to, to manliness is a neutered <laughs> poodle. <laughs> It's miniature. miniature. <laughs> they could fit in someone's pocket. Yeah. So yeah. I named him Tabasco so he would have a little bit of edge to him. Oh, but it's strong. What's your it's dog's strong. name? My dog's name is Bruce. Ah, and, uh, like my, the shark I, from Jaws. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, it's a very Aussie name. And, uh, you know, there's a Monty Python skit that uh, you may remember that it's, it's in the Monty Python are making fun of Aussies. And they're all like, hey, Bruce, hey, Bruce, hey, Bruce. We're talking about, hey, everyone's name is Bruce. And some guy's name, some some guy comes along. He's like, "Hi, I'm Charles." And they're like, "You mind if we call you Bruce?" So there's no confusion. You know? Hilarious! <laughs> so, I didn't anyway, know that. So is that why is that why Bruce from the Australian shark from Finding Nemo is that why that shark is named Bruce? You know, I do not know the etymology of the shark's name, <laughs> but. Uh, Dick, that they'd be a good chance because he is Aussie. He's an Aussie character. It's an Aussie character that yes. I always thought if you close your eyes listening to Finding Nemo, it sounds exactly like Brian Houston. Yeah. That shark <laughs> from Finding Nemo. We always thought it was We him. were always like, oh my gosh, I feel like the spirit of Hillsong coming upon me whenever like <laughs> In the Jesus shark would speak. Yeah, it sounded exactly <laughs> like it. <laughs> and then his name's Bruce. So that's that, that's two and that two. My is mind so is blown. That's so funny. There you why, go. why is that so popular in Australia? I do not know. Bruce. My dad's middle name is Bruce and my middle name is Bruce. And I had all daughters and they're very thankful that they did not inherit that name. <laughs> yeah, you guys went Sydney, Scarlet, and Violet. Very good so names. So beautiful. Two colors. 
and then the capital of Australia. Yes. And, uh, yeah. And then Sydney is Sydney. Yeah. And one of the greatest fevers ever to wreak havoc on civilization, you know? Indeed. Indeed. So good. Okay. So you've been in America 25 years from Australia. Yes. Um, and you've talked and preached famously about the immigration process, naturalization process, becoming an American. Um, but w- what do you miss most about Australia, about living over there? Mm-hmm. Well, every Aussie basically lives at the beach in Australia. You know, it's the largest coastline of any country in the world. And you have 93% or something uh, live, live at the coast. So I, you know, I live in Nashville, so I'm landlocked for the first time in my life. And uh, I definitely miss the beach. Australian beaches are astounding. Mm. And um, I, I completely took it for granted my entire life because I always had it. And then uh, I moved to Nashville and I missed the coast. So I miss that. I miss some of the food. Uh, there are certain parts of Aussie culture. Aussies are very sarcastic and that humor really appeals to me. And so uh, there's a lot. There's a lot that I miss about Australia, but uh, I've lived more than half my life in America now. Wow. So I am, uh, in one sense, I've logged more days in this country than I did in my country of birth. Oh, wow. Okay, what's the best thing about American then? Uh, <laughs> America, not American. <laughs> what's <laughs> the best, the best thing, thing, thing that you've enjoyed about, or, or that when you first got here, most was like, oh, this is... This is, this is hands down what's great about America. Oh, there's lots of things. I mean, Americans, Americans celebrate success really well. They, um, Aussies have what's called the tall poppy syndrome. And uh, this, the, this comes from, it's, it's actually or, originates in Great Britain, but it's, it's the idea of cutting the head off of a flower. So if a flower comes up and emerges particularly high, they want to cut it off. So, so for whatever reason, what's baked into the Aussie culture is when someone uh, is successful or they win or something like that, Aussies, a lot of Aussies, tend to tall poppy syndrome, cut the head off it, you know, like, ah. Bring it down. You know. Bring it down. Yeah, just knock them down. Yeah. Don't boast too much too, right? That's yeah, kind of don't the boast. Thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so Americans, Americans are just encouraging people. You know, and, uh, and, and I, you know, the, the meritocracy, I think there's so much, there's so much encouragement and belief, uh, Americans do things so well as exemplified by the, the Olympics just Mm. last, you know, um, so I, I love that about America. America is, is very welcoming to outsiders. Americans are nicer to Aussies than Aussies are to Americans. Hmm. Hmm. And, um, but you know, Australia's. Uh, Australia has like a, just a little bit of an inferiority complex sometimes because the U S is so dominant, you know, Australians consume American media, you know, it's, it's a a music industry, uh, the, uh, you know, network television. It's, it's like American culture is global culture, Western culture, and it's defined by America. And, um, and so Aussies are very familiar with the American story and the American moment. And no American could tell you who the prime minister of Australia is right now. True. You know? I couldn't. So, um, you know, that, I, I love that about the U.S. I think for me as an immigrant, I probably see the opportunity that is around every corner in this country that maybe – a lot of Americans don't see because it's what they've always known. Wow. And uh, I just think this is a pl- – I'm, I'm filled with wonder. This place fills my heart with wonder and gratitude. I, I love living here. Amazing. Wow. Well, I love that. Filled with wonder. Filled with wonder. And your wa- and Brandy is American. Or is she- Brandy right. is American. Okay. And, uh, and she you- is a seventh-generation Tennessean. Mm. So uh, her roots in Tennessee run very, very deep. So my my daughters have a mother from Tennessee and a father from Australia. They say "g'day, y'all." That's <laughs> so <laughs> real funny. It's That's real so mess. funny. <laughs> g'day, y'all. Oh my god! I really like that. Love I like it. That a lot. So, how did you and Brandy meet? I haven't heard that story. So um, I was uh, a, a youth pastor in Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, she was attending another church. She, uh, her parents were quite well-known 
uh, they were college professors in the community and she wanted uh, to have a little more anonymity. And so she decided that she was going to try other churches. And so she came to our church and uh, went on Sunday. And then uh, she'd grown up uh, in a tradition where you went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. So she came Wednesday night looking for the service and we, our church didn't have a service except for our youth group service. And um, we had a, a, a pretty cranking youth ministry and, uh, and we did a, 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 a youth service. And someone said to her, she showed up, you know, are you looking for the service? And she said, yeah. So she went to the student ministry service. She was 26 years old. <laughs> and um, she just loved it and she just kept coming. And one day I uh, told a story about, uh, I was making an illustration sort of about domestic violence and she stood in line to talk to me and then she came up and she said, um, you talked about domestic violence today. Uh, I'm a social worker, I work for the government and I work with children, teenagers who are, are victims of violent crime or sex abuse. Mm. And she said, if you ever need, if sometimes when you raise these things, it, it, it causes people to respond with their own story. And she said, if that happens, I, I just want you to know you got a resource here where I can help. And honestly, it did happen. Wow. Uh, a kid came forward with an allegation. Uh, we, as a church, are a mandatory reporter, and I'd never done that before. And so uh, I reached out to her, and she guided me through the process, and uh, we've been together ever since. Oh, oh come on. Oh, my gosh. That's 23... 24 years ago. Wow. wow. Come on. Well, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's, praise and God. congratulations on both your birthday, 50 years, and yes. uh, 24 years of marriage. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys started a church called the Church yes. of the City. In, Correct. I mean, you guys have multiple locations in different places, but uh, started yes. in Franklin, Tennessee. Yes. It's, it's, it's an amazing church. Beautiful, uh, vibrant. We know lots of people who attend including our good mutual friend, Lisa Harper, who yes. raves about you and everyone mm. we know who loves loves the, the church. We, we uh, adore Lisa. You guys started the church in 2013? Correct. Um, how did that come about? Uh, give us maybe kind of fly over of these last 11 years, just what, what God's done in that work. And mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been uh, a really... Really, we're really thankful, really grateful for the story that has unfolded. Uh, I was, I moved to the US in 1998 and I just sort of give a little bit of backstory. I came over here to work in radio and um, I applied for a work visa to work at a Christian radio station and the American consulate office in Melbourne misread and misunderstood my file and they gave me the wrong kind of visa. They gave me a a pastor's visa, a religious worker's visa instead of a commercial visa. And I'd never planned on becoming a pastor. I had no <laughs> pastor aspirations. Um, but through an administrative error, I got a pastor's visa. And the only way I could stay in America is if I became a pastor. So sometimes people ask me, you know, how did the Lord call you into ministry? I say the U.S. government called me into this. <laughs> so funny. You share and, that story in your book, Holy Roar. Oh, my yes, God. Yes. I remember right. the first time I read it, I laughed so hard because it's really funny. It's like, Paul, an apostle, not by the will of man, by the will of God. It's like, Darren Whitehead, an apostle, by the will of the United States uh, Immigration right. Services. <laughs> I, was, I was commissioned by the U.S. accidentally out of fear of deportation. I just keep preaching every single week. Hoping no one will ever figure I'm it out. Terrified. That yes. is amazing. So um, I came over and I worked at a Southern Baptist church called the People's Church in Franklin, Tennessee. And I worked here for six years. Um, during that time, John Tyson joined the staff as well. And he and I led the student ministry together. Oh, I didn't know that. I knew you guys were bros, but I didn't realize you were on a staff at a church together. We were. Yeah, yeah. And so then um, he ended up going to Florida and then to New York. And I went to Chicago and I was uh, on staff at a church called Willow Creek. And I was there for eight years. So all of my children were born in Chicago. And, uh, and then in, in 2013, we moved back to the Nashville area where my wife's family is. And uh, we decided that we really wanted to plant a church that was trying to reach uh, college students at the time or, or, or millennials, mm. the most, at the time, the most unreached group in America. And Nashville is, uh, is a hub for... Uh, education and 40% of, of kids who move here 
to go to school stay after they graduate. Um, and, you know, and uh, Nashville has doubled in size uh, in the time that I've lived here. It used wow. to be a million, now it's two million. So uh, we decided that we would plant, we planted two churches on the same day. We planted one in the morning in uh, East Nashville and we planted one in the evening in Franklin. And we had one in sort of a a low income, uh, diverse community. And we had one in a a more established, wealthier suburban context. So we we planted two. Hmm. We had one set of gear. So we would get up really early, go and set up chairs and everything, uh, put on the service, tear it down, drive across town, reload in again, and then do the same thing again, then tear it down, and we didn't have any trouble sleeping. But we were having the time of our lives, honestly. Yeah, wow. It was, it was really, really rich, and um, we did that for two years. So at the two-year mark, the People's Church, the church that Tyson and I served at years ago, had uh, their senior pastor of 33 years resigned and moved away, and the elders of that church came to me and said, what would you think about uh, merging our churches together? We have two buildings and you don't have buildings. Um, it, was, it was an aging Southern Baptist church. And, uh, and, and so, you know, we kind of prayed about this. We put out a fleece, Brandy and I did, and God answered this prayer with such astonishing specificity we knew we had to do this. So uh, we inherited $7 million of debt Ooh, in taking on this property. Lucky you. Wow. The debt, the debt had ballooned in interest rates and it was costing a million dollars a year to service the debt. Oh, Jeez. my Lord. And in one of the meetings, I was, you know, in one of the meetings where we were sort of looking at feasibility of all of this, I had a Q&A with their church and that would be sort of a town hall style meeting and they're asking me, questions about theology, ecclesiology, and philosophy of ministry and all that. And uh, at one point, someone stands up and, and has a question for me. Do you realize we have $7 million of debt? And I said, yes. And, uh, and he said, well, what would you do about that? And without thinking, I kind of said, well, I think I pay it off as quickly as possible. I mean, very profound, right? <laughs> and it was the biggest applause of the evening. Oh, my God. Jeez. And honestly, I sensed the Holy Spirit just whisper to me, they just want leadership. Yeah. Because mm. I, I thought, I'm glad you're applauding because you're the ones that are going to have to pay this off. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Keep clapping when we do the offering. Keep yeah. Clapping, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So um, the first thing we did after merging, we, we, we basically we shut down their two buildings for 40 days. We did 40 days of prayer. We had everyone come and meet at the school and we renovated the building. And then in 40 days, we reopened as a sort of like a whole new era, Church of the City. And, hmm. and, um, and the first thing I, I said to the church is, uh, what if we paid off this debt in a year? What wow. if we just recklessly, irresponsibly, filled with faith, just like paid it all off? And I'd never done anything like this before. Uh, lots of uh, fundraising consultants would have told me it's a bad idea. <laughs> you know, you really need to have a five to seven year plan to do this. And, you know, it's not equal gifts, it's equal sacrifice. You know, the whole thing, right? Right, right. I just said, like, if we, if we could pay this off, we would free up a million dollars a year that we could pour into the community. And uh, people caught a vision for that. And uh, in, in 13 months, in just, just over a year, we paid off every single cent and we didn't have any big gifts, <laughs> which was crazy because I kind of thought a sugar daddy's going to drop three mil and say, let the kids do the rest, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and he didn't. I, I, we didn't get a million dollar gift. We didn't get a half a million dollar gift. The biggest gift we got was 200K. Wow. And the average was $7,000 from regular families who chose not to go on a vacation that year because they wanted the church to be out of debt. Wow. Bro, and we had a beautiful. sense that God was going to release something in the spirit when we were released from the, the shackles of debt to Bank of America, mm. right? And I thought that that would be the most incredible story I tell for the rest of my life, and God was just getting started. Wow. 
Praise so, God. Um, wow, wow, wow. So yeah, so that that so two two and a half years in or, or three years into our story, we own two buildings. And, um, you know, it's probably at the time about $50 million worth of assets. Um, it's, it's more than double that now just because of cost of real estate in our community. Incredible. Gosh. Bro, well, praise God for that. The vision, I, I, I know we don't have time to talk about it today because there's so much, but I mean, I know you guys have big vision and you mm. guys are swinging for the fences to do new things and reach the city and, um, I celebrate all that. I do want to talk. Uh, I mentioned your book, Holy Roar, which you wrote with Chris Tomlin uh, yes. on the seven different words for worship. Is it seven? Yeah, seven. Seven, yeah. seven words for worship in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing book. You also Stunning. wrote a book called Rumors of God uh, yes. in 2011. But your newest book is The Digital Fast. I'm holding it here. Mm. Uh, this is 40 Days to Detox Your Mind and Reclaim What Matters Most. Uh, I wanted to give us plenty of time to talk about this because I know this is a, a needed word, yes. making sense of the crazy uh, that we are living in right now. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about this uh, and and how it came about and the research you did and, and what, what's going on with this. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So I mentioned I got three teenage daughters. I few years ago, I took them out on a date, um, you know, one-on-one date in, in, a, in a week. And uh, I was sort of feeling quietly confident about my dad game. I, uh, I thought I would ask them a question to ask them each the same two questions. And that the two questions were, uh, what is dad doing right that he needs to do more of? And what is dad doing wrong that he needs to do less of? And um, each of them had a different story for what I was doing right uh, I drop them off to school in the mornings. They like it when I make them laugh. Uh, they like it when I accidentally hurt myself. So please do that more. Uh, <laughs> you know, so they, they each had something different to, to, to celebrate that I was doing. When I said, what am I doing wrong? Then you do less of. They all word for word said the same thing. I wish you weren't on your phone so much. Ooh. Ooh. And every parent that is further along than me, uh, they've, 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 they've sent their kids out of the home. They all say the same thing. These years are fleeting and they go so quick and they evaporate before your eyes. And for me to be exchanging the infinitely valuable years and moments with my children, to be doom scrolling cat videos on Instagram <laughs> just feels like an exchange that, that makes me feel ashamed of myself. Mm. You know? Wow. So, um, <laughs> these devices have seeped their way into our lives, right? Right. You know, the, the iPhone came out in, in uh, 2007 and uh, I actually got one on opening weekend and, uh, you know, we've pretty much been inseparable ever since. <laughs> and this is not something that I realize as the iPhone has developed, so the technology has developed, it has become so much more uh, insidious and, and harmful. Uh, in many ways, we think that we control our lives through our smartphones. Mm. But what is happening is our lives are being controlled by our smartphones. Uh, We think we have master of it and it really has mastery over us. And uh, we do a, we do a fast, we do a 21 days of prayer and fasting to begin every year. And, um, and I, and, and so many people started saying, well, uh, I want to fast from my phone instead. And I thought, well, that's interesting. That is not what biblical fasting is. Right. Um, and biblical fasting is probably the most neglected spiritual practice in the modern world. We don't want to fast. It's uncomfortable, you know? Unless we count intermittent fasting, which intermittent is so funny because a pastor says, we'll do a fast, the church groans. Joe Rogan says intermittent fasting is great. Everyone's like, I'm in it. I'm in Let's it. Go. Let's go. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So true. So um, we, I, I, I started sharing with the church like, fasting from your phone is actually a good idea, but it's a different idea. So what I want to do is I, mean, I want to have- You are a, fasting from a different kind of feed, you know, just to be clear. Ooh. There you go. There you go. Yes. <laughs> uh, what, is, what is really quite interesting is that so many of us use our phones in the same ways that we have used food in the past. Wow. So we use our phones to distract ourselves, to comfort ourselves, to cover over feelings- um, if you feel ashamed, if you feel anxious, if you feel um, 
nervous about something or, sh- or, or uh, uh, um, you know, that you've got conflict that's making you feel uncomfortable, almost as a reflex action, you, you flip open and you start looking at something to numb yourself. Mm. That's generally how people have also snacked in history. True. So um, we decided that what would it look like if we as an entire church went on a digital fast? Social scientists call the problem with cell phone technology a, a collective action problem. And that is that we all know that these are having a detrimental impact on our mental health, but none of us want to stop using them because we'll miss out, right? right. It's, it's sort of the doorway to know things and to connect with other people and ask a teenager if they know that Instagram or TikTok is, is having a detrimental impact on their mental health and say, so well, then stop using it. They're like, I can't. All my mm, friends are right. mm-hmm. So that's a collective action problem. Collectively, as a community, we are doing something that is harmful, but it's really hard to break the cycle. Right. Well, the way you address collective action problems is with collective action. And the church is the most ideal space to do that. So if you ever ask someone, have you ever done a digital detox? Almost everyone says the same thing. No, but I need to. Right. Mm. And, and the problem is no one wants to do it on their own. Right. But if everyone's doing it, if your family's doing it, your kids are doing it, your kids' friends are doing it, your, 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 your friends at church are doing it, your small groups are doing it, your whole church is doing it, you, you sort of gamify the entire experience. Wow. And you're all stepping back at the same time. Mm. And uh, it, 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 instead of FOMO, what we say around here is it's JOMO. It's the joy of missing out. You wow. You actually step into an experience that is actually better. Come on. And you're doing it community-wide. So who knew that the church would be poised in society as the perfect sub-community to adopt these kind of practices together that are ultimately very, very helpful for a societal problem at large. Because we have, independent of our devices, a built-in meeting point weekly and the rhythms of gathering that don't need social media to, to do so. Correct. Mm. And, and not only that, it is, it is every age in society. It is, it is socioeconomic. You know, so you've got, you know, intergenerational, yeah. you've got economic, you've got all vocations represented. I mean, it is truly a hub, a, a melting pot of, of connecting people. Yeah. And you Brilliant. are in the new year going to invite other churches to take part in a 40 day fast from social media together. Is that right? Yeah, so we're going to do a slightly modified version because we want to start in January 1. We're uh, about to release uh, a- another version of the fast. It's going to be a 28-day version. Gotcha. So 28-day version, and we're inviting churches uh, all over the U.S. to jump on board. And we've already got lots of churches that are, that are saying we're going to be a part of this. We would love for an opportunity for what we've done in our church I've had lots of, the reason I wrote the book is that other pastors were reaching out saying, how do you even do this? Yeah. What does a digital fast actually even mean? How many right. years have you done it with Church of the City? We've done it twice. Okay. Wow. So for two years. Yeah. And, and by the way, the second time people looked forward to it, mm. even teenagers look forward to it. They're like, we're really into this and we want to do it. Beautiful. What's amazing is 100% of people who do a digital fast are glad they did it. 100%. I mean, results speak for themselves there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, no, one, no one says, um, you know, I really wish I'd spent five more hours doom scrolling. Yeah. <laughs> People are glad they did it. It's you know? true. It's just the, the pain of getting onto the diet, the pain of getting into the workout right. regimen, the pain of killing these, the strings to our digital life. Once you're in it, yeah, you, you've, it's like, oh my gosh, I'm peaceful. I'm out of the matrix, right? Life is better. Exactly. So, so the, the digital fast is, is four movements. So the 40-day version is four 10-day movements. The 28-day version is four seven-day movements. But the, it's the same thing. The first, the first movement is detach. And uh, you, you're really inviting people to essentially remove all of the distraction apps off your phone. So if you think about your phone through the lens of distraction versus utility, not all the apps have the same amount of impact on you. Not all the apps are detrimental. So you want to get apps off of your phone 
like social media, games, news apps, video apps, get email off of your phone if you can do that, and reduce your phone down to a utility device. That is phone, text, calendar, GPS. You know, when you bought a flight what, on what Southwest. What about Duolingo? Calculator. <laughs> yeah, what about Duolingo? <laughs> Duolingo may be, depending on uh, your world, uh, an important thing. It might be. I don't want to break my streak, Darren. <laughs> I've got a very long streak. But you can do Duolingo on the computer. That's right. Oh. And, and I suggest that anything you can do on a computer, do that on a computer and get mm-hmm. it off your phone for, for the period of the, of, of the fast, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the, the utility apps are not detrimental. They're not distracting. You don't play with the calculator for 55 minutes and then wonder where did the time go, you know? <laughs> True. So, Someone out there is like, I do. Mm, I do. Real yeah. sad. Sad. You just made fun of the math guy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> exactly. No. I wonder if I added these numbers together. Yeah. Yes. So, all right. So the first movement is to detach. And like any sort of habit that you have, there is some level of discomfort. But if you remove these apps from your phone, what's going to happen is you're going to open your phone, you're going to look at it, realize there's nothing cool on it anymore, and then close it again. Hmm. And that's what happens in that first movement. But you're doing it with other people, which makes it great. You sort of, it's a fellowship of suffering, right? Right. The next movement is to discover. And you start to discover all kinds of things that you've been missing. Dang. Discovering in your children, how many times have we missed a signal from one of our kids where we should have really engaged. Mm. We had no idea because we were looking at a glowing rectangle, you know? Mm. So we start to discover in other people. We start to discover things in ourselves. Uh, There are a lot of feelings that we're having that we're not dealing with because we're numbing ourselves with our phones that all of a sudden we start to be aware of them and we're actually able to deal with them in real time instead of mounting like a beach ball held down beneath the surface. Some... uh, Sociologists believe that the rise of the panic attack is is attached to the fact that we are not processing our feelings in real time. Mm. We are suppressing them. And like a beach ball, at some point, this suppression explodes and we have these panic attacks. That makes sense. So um, So good. You also discover the voice of God. Mm. I mean, how much have these devices robbed the discretionary in between times of our day. Yeah. You pull up at the lights and instead of Holy Spirit, what do you want me to pay attention to? Your attention is ambushed by your phone. You're just like looking at dumb stuff, right? Right. Or you're checking your email or someone's texted you and you want to get back to them, whatever. So the next movement is to discover. The third movement is to delight. Mm. And this is really where it gets fun. And I, I, I got to uh, interview Jonathan Haidt recently. He wrote the book, The Anxious Generation. Mm. And I was telling him about this. And he said, do you want to know the brain science on why it's delightful? He said, it takes a couple of weeks for your dopamine receptors to reset. Wow. Essentially what we're doing is we are overdosing ourselves with dopamine and dopamine stops doing what it used to do. And that is bring joy and pleasure to our brains. So we stop feeling joy and pressure, a pleasure. We instead just feel numb and tired and a little cluttered in our brains. What happens is if you are not hitting dopamine all the time, you know, you know, all throughout the day, your dopamine receptors reset and dopamine starts doing what it's supposed to do and you start to feel joy again. Mm, it's actually brain come on. doing this. Thing. And then you notice all kinds of things, you know, like it's so funny, but it is like you reset the senses of your body. You walk outside and you smell the air <laughs> and then you feel the grass under your feet and you look at the sky and you kind of haven't noticed that before. <laughs> and it's just like you become human again. Wow. Can you believe it? Wow. It's like and the way a the- carrot stick tastes after you've been on the Daniel diet forever, you know, or, or, or something, exactly right. the, the slightest bit of sweet you introduce is like, like, whoa. Or an dessert. apple. Yes. That's, yeah. that's, that's more what I meant. Like yeah. Candy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, and then the fourth movement is to determine, and that is, what do I want my long-term digital habits to look like? Mm. Uh, Marie Kondo uh, famously has the the whole, you know, cleaning out your closet yes. and all of that. You've seen Tidying that. up magically. 
That's right. And, <laughs> and, and she has this question you're supposed to ask of your items of clothing. Does this spark joy? Right. Well, I want people to Marie Kondo their digital life. Ooh. And as you clean off your phone, ask yourself the question, does having Instagram on my phone spark joy? Yeah, right. Does TikTok spark joy? Does Facebook spark joy? Before I just go from a detox to a retox, Hmm. should I like consider what do I want this to actually look like? And um, sort of an informal survey, my daughter did this for a school project, but she surveyed a bunch of people in our church and asked them what percentage of people put social media back on their phone. 49% of people didn't put social media back on their phone. Wow. So almost one in two said, you know what? I think life's better without this on my phone. It's, 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 It's largely about not just the content, but the frequency. When you have these devices, which are like an appendage, you've always got that constant temptation to be looking at essentially visual junk food. Right. And when you do that, just like when you consume junk food, you don't feel good and you feel a little bit ashamed of yourself. But if you don't have junk food around you, you don't eat it. Yeah, right. It's amazing how that Amen. works. Okay, yeah, so how it works. This where is so can good. people go? I'm sure pastors, leaders hearing this are like, man, we want to get in on this. Where can people go to enlist their church and be a part of it? Yeah, so if you go to the website, digitalfast2025.com, digitalfast2025, I'm working with Gabe Lyons and Think Media, hmm. and um, we're, we're, we're rolling this out. We would love to get 100,000 people doing a digital fast for the first 28 days of the year. I think it's an amazing opportunity for the church to lead hmm. because this is a societal problem. This is not a problem that is in the faith space. Only it's a problem in everyone's finding this. It's young and old and male and female. And very rarely do you have, if you ask someone, how do you feel about your relationship with your smartphone? Very rarely is someone going, oh, it's great. Most people are like, yeah, not great. You know? So there's, there's got to be somehow some healthy alternative to the extremes of either addiction or Amish, right? Right. You've got to find a way to have reimagine a much healthier way of doing this. So Digital Fast 2025, and uh, we've got a bunch of resources there. There's a workbook that we're releasing that's a very analog experience. It's getting people off of their phones, and it is filling in boxes and reading and drawing, and there's a, there's a devotional for every single day as we lead you through each of the movements of the fast. And, um, man, we would love if, 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 if God blessed this effort I mean, it would be great to get national media talking about this. Yeah. This is a way where the church is, is, is taking an ancient practice, applying it to new technology for the betterment of a pretty significant societal problem. Sure. Wow. So digital fast 2025.com. So good. Great. This is no, the, amazing. The book no. is the digital fast for the 40 day one. If you're like, nope, 28 days ain't going to cut it for me, honey. I'm That's way right. more. 40 days is much more biblical. Maybe you <laughs> yes. need the 40, uh, but the if you want to join the digital fast.com is the, is the 40 day version. And uh, there's more information there as well on the 28 day version. And you can get both on Amazon. So um, yeah, the, the, the the real magic, and I had no idea it was going to be as magic as it is, is actually doing it in a church. Interesting. Um, yeah. I love Cause, that. Because it's just, it, you know, it's a, a, a fasting is not just a call to abstaining. We're not just calling people to put down something. We're calling people to pick up something. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so uh, we want to turn down the distraction of digital technology and turn up devotion. We want people in the scripture, in God's word, uh, accessing themselves to the to the voice of God through the Scripture, and um, it's a it's an amazing way to start a year, a fresh new year on the other side of the election, ha- having got through all of the noise of that era. Uh, I think it's going to be a cleanse 
for our for our brains and for our souls as we start out 2025. Well, I love it. Yeah, I hope people will do it. Even if your church doesn't participate, you could get your small group together to do it. Get get some people in your life. So you're not doing it alone. Yeah, I think it's great. Um, I'm excited to participate in it. See what God does. Yeah, Darren, is there anything else going on in your life or ministry you want to mention today that that we might not have covered? You know, um, one of the most exciting things that we are working on as a church is we are building a ministry called The Village. And uh, this came out of asking um, our city officials, what are the greatest needs in our city and what could we as a church do to help? Hmm. We did a listening tour. We met with the governor. We met with the mayor. We met with the chief of police. We met with police officers and Department of Children's Service workers and we just said, what are, the, what are the biggest problems and how could a church help engage them? The outcome of that was five issues. Um, the first is uh, mental health and suicide prevention. We, we, there was a 42% rise in suicide in our community. Mm. Uh, the second is reliable transportation for single mothers, single parents. Uh, the third is uh, space for kids that are awaiting uh, placement in foster care homes. Uh, the kids were sleeping in the government building because there was no place for them to go. Mm. Uh, the fourth is we just need more foster families. And we believe that uh, the, the pool to fish in for that is God's people, the church, uh, welcoming vulnerable children in our own backyard. And the fifth was the, the, the massive numbers of kids who are aging out of child welfare system each year. And uh, the majority of the boys end up pr in pr prison the majority of the girls end up pregnant mm. and the children that they have also go into the foster care system. So we wanted to get upstream on, on some of these issues. Uh, what you may realize is that uh, when, a, when a social worker and a youth pastor get married, this is the kind of yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like a uh, match made in heaven. It's wonderful. So uh, we are <laughs> building three buildings. Uh, it's it's uh, become a, a $50 million project. And uh, our, our church has, has funded the whole thing. Uh, we're building it with cash. Um, I've never seen such a tailwind from heaven behind a, something in all my life. It feels like I'm not trying to do something and ask God to bless it. God's trying to do something and he's involving me, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, I told you that no one gave us, you know, significant gifts when I was dreaming about this idea, someone gave me two and a half million dollars in an unformed idea. Oh, I man. told that story in church. Someone else gave me a million dollars. We did one dinner where we were discussing this. We raised $17 million Ooh. with 40 families. And do you know why I think it is? This is sincerely so close to the heart of God. Yeah, I mean, it's James yes. 1, really. It's James 1, 27. Yeah. Yes. yes. And, and, and you think about what, one translation of that is Pure religion in the sight of God the Father mm. is caring for orphans and widows. There's a lot of things done under the banner of religion that God does not call pure. Very this good. is the one wow. thing wow. God calls pure. Yeah. And it just, it has been like nothing that I've ever seen in my life. Mm. We just broke ground about three months ago, and it's going to be done in about 18 months from now. And uh, we're going to have an outdoor food port where we, uh, we take uh, new businesses. There's kids uh, in some low-income areas in our community who have started food service businesses. Uh, they've dreamed up the idea. They've had a coach. They've helped uh, work with them to fund the idea. And then they've started their own food service business like food trucks and so forth. So what we were doing is we we're building a food court and we're having all of these kids with their new businesses to come and sell food to our church. And when church gets out on a Sunday, everyone's got to eat, right? Right. And instead of them going to Chili's, we're harnessing the purchasing power of young underestimated entrepreneurs as they've started their new food service business. And I tell our church to tip them really well. So we piloted this idea. And, and I mean, it was the kingdom of God in our parking lot, honestly. Gosh, and these kids it. were like, these kids were doing more revenue in three hours than they did in a month. Oh my God. And so we are going to be able to, we're going to have a space where we can permanently do this every week. And, uh, you know, this is going to allow people that wouldn't ordinarily ever get a chance to meet one another 
guys who own businesses who want to do catering throughout the week are going to be able to use these businesses to do all of that. So um, that's called The Village. And um, that has us pretty excited these days. Is there a website wow. for it or anywhere people can get more information on that? Yeah. If you go to cotc.com slash village. Um, C-O-T-C, churchofthecity.com slash village. Village. Yes. Very cool, Darren. Gosh, well, man, God bless God. all of that. Wow. Really, I'm just so inspired very exciting. by your guys' faith. And if you're and- in the Nashville area, I'm sure you come check it out in Franklin. That's where that's at, right? Yes, in Franklin. Yeah, that's where we're building the village. Yeah, yeah that's right. Come on. Bro, thanks for coming Thank on today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are you kidding? This is amazing. Yeah. I love you guys. Uh, I, I, um, privately texted Levi a couple of weeks ago. He had a certain moment where he was speaking at a church and, uh, and it really struck me that, that, that God is, 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 has positioned Levi to, to, to speak to the church in America in yeah. certain moments. And, um, I'm really proud of you, Levi, and really pr- proud of how you are stewarding that. Yes. Oh, man. Amen. Too kind. Well, that Amen. encouraged me then. You encouraged me now. Darren, uh, all of this has been a blessing for our listeners and for us, and yeah. can't wait till we can do it again, hopefully with with the lovely uh, Mrs. Whitehead. And, uh, she would love to. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. bless you, brother. We love you. God bless you. Love you guys, too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to swing by LeviLusco.com and JennyLusco.com to see what's going on in our world. And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And in the meantime, we would love to connect with you on social media. Jenny Jenny and Levi Levi Lusco, out. out.